So the next speaker is Anders Hackfeld, who will talk today about the versatility of mesoscopic solar cells. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, it's a big pleasure for me to uh, overview a bit of what we are doing at EPFL. Thanks a lot to Monica for inviting me here to this very nice uh, meeting, and also for our uh, collaboration with your visiting us at EPFL over the last year. So thanks a lot, Monica. It's a great pleasure to be here. So. Um, I will talk a little bit of dye-sensitized solar cells and then I will also overview a bit on the things what we do with the perovskite cells, efficiencies and also some of the stability data we have at the moment. A bit of an update on dye-sensitized cells. Here you find some of the demonstrators. Uh, they are all based on uh, the iodide, triiodide as a redox couple. And during the last years where we have seen uh, the uh, let's say the development of dye sensitized cell towards higher efficiency and so on, it has been based on trying to replace this iodide uh, redox couple. So if we look into the energy level diagram of a dye sensitized cell, we have typically a mesoporous layer of titanium dioxide with the conduction band here. We sensitize it with a dye molecule. Uh, nowadays we use typically organic molecules with the Homo level here, you excite to the excited state, you inject electrons into the TiO2, transport it through the mesoporous layer, and then we, uh, at the cathode, reduce the electrolyte. And then we include the redox potential of the electrolyte here, where we have the iodide, triiodide here, giving a typical photovoltage of 0.7 volts at, at sunlight intensity. Uh, but the thing here is if we compare the redox potential to the oxidation potential, we have a driving force, or a, uh, well, I happened to teach thermodynamics yesterday too. <laughs> <laughs> so delta G is uh, something like 0.7 volts here. And that's a big potential loss internally. So that's where we think we have the chance to, to do something. But if we replace the iodide redox couple, uh, we also open up uh, recombination process, which is that the electrons in the TiO2 react with the oxidized species of the electrolyte. Doesn't happen very efficiently for uh, the I minus, I3 minus, but basically for everything else that is a killing reaction. So we need to passivate the surface and a few years back we managed to design dye molecules, organic dye molecules with this triarylamine unit with some alkoxy groups here, which in itself passivate that reaction. So that opened up for us to use cobalt uh, complex electrolytes. We could lower the driving force to about 0.4 volt here with an open circuit voltage of around 0.9 volt and that created the world record efficiencies published of about 15% today. Question is, can we find even something better? And then uh, uh, our speaker tomorrow, Marina Freitag, came as a postdoc to us in Uppsala at the time and she started to work with copper complexes and that's why we are focusing our work at the moment. So with the copper complexes we have a high redox potential. This makes a driving force for regenerating the dye about 0.2 volt. We think we cannot live with much less, let's say. And that's uh, giving us very exciting results at the moment. Here is a publication where we show 10% efficiency, but the important thing here is the voltage. We have more than one volt now for dye sensitized cells, and our latest results based on similar organic dyes and similar copper complexes, phenantrolene ligands, is around 13% efficiency, and the voltage is our best at 1.15 volt at the best. So we are in a way competing with the perovskite now on the voltage side at least. So that's a little bit fun of, of that. Uh, moreover, we have also very interesting data on indoor. We have heard some talks about indoor applications. Uh, and this is, with dye molecules, of course, uh, a perfect technology because you can perfectly design your dye molecule so it absorbs the spectrum of the lamp you have. So that's a benefit for us. Uh, and this is a work we did, we did with two organic dyes in, as a co-sensitized system with the copper phenantrolene. I just go quickly to the data because Marina will tomorrow describe this more in detail. Uh, we have for indoor light 200 lux, uh, 15 microwatt per square centimeter. Uh, I was sitting at the back in the morning, so I'm not sure exactly if I saw the numbers, but this is a very good number. Today we have even up to 18 microwatt per square centimeter. And we are comparing favorably to even gallium arsenide here. 
So the gallium arsenide we got from uh, Alta devices shows 13, 14 microwatt per, per uh, square centimeter. So if I'm courageous enough to stick my neck out, maybe the DEC is giving our the best efficiency we can have for indoor light. If we turn this into efficiencies, it goes to 29%, and at the moment we're even higher than 30% for uh, indoor light. We have also another surprise with the copper complex, and this happens, uh, the disensitized cell is an electrochemical system. It's based on a liquid electrolyte, and of course one practical problem is that you have to encapsulate your liquid. Uh, and we are not very good in doing that in Uppsala, we have to admit, so here the solvent was leaking out, evaporating. So after a month old we had cells on the shelf uh, being leaked out, dried out, which we normally threw away into the glass bin. Uh, our technician at the time for some reason had perhaps nothing else to do, I guess, so he took these old dried out cells, measured them, and measured higher efficiency than in the liquid state. Very strange to us. Uh, we call them the zombie cells, actually, because they should be dead, but they are somehow alive, and we try to understand what's going on. But in some kind of solid state things, here is a measurement where we measure the conductivity of the electrolyte. So if it's in the liquid state, we have uh, this conductivity. Uh, and if we go to the zombie state, as we call it, the conductivity is clearly increasing. So that's an interesting uh, possible change of uh, transport mechanism to a hopping mechanism between the copper sides, we think. Uh, the, our best efficiency here is 11% uh, at the moment, so very close to the liquid data, let's say. And it's the best solid state disensitized cell efficiency as far as we know. So that's a little bit of the update of the disensitized cell. Marina will talk more about it tomorrow. I switch to the perovskite cell where for EPFL an important step in the direction was to use uh, mixed composition and this was done uh, a few years back now by for example Norman Pellet who is here with his company Candlelight. Uh, they started to work on mixing in uh, formamidinium to the methyl ammonium uh, also done of course by Professor Siok and others. Also on the halide side, uh, tuning the band gap a bit with the bromide. Uh, this showed not only a tuning of the band gap, but larger grains were formed, higher quality films, better efficiency and so on. Uh, and uh, our postdoc at the time, uh, some years back, Dong Chin Bi, she optimized this recipe and got 21% certified, which we were very happy with it coincided with Christmas 2015 so we had a big celebration at our Christmas party uh, and we were happy for about three four months <laughs> and then uh, Professor Suk took his world record back at uh, the time then 21.2.1 percent and as you know now it's 22.7 uh, when that happened we said let's change the game a little bit let's try to take the one square centimeter world record uh, because that you go into the nice photovoltaic tables of Martin Greens and others. So we switched there and published a paper of the world record for uh, one square centimeter at 19.6%. We were happy for about one week. <laughs> 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 then Professor Sook uh, presented the certified 19.7% efficiency. <laughs> so we are close, but that's the race at the moment going on. Um, we um, continued, and Michael Saliba and others uh, in our groups with Michael Gretzel uh, said, okay, there is also other cations of interest. Some published work on cesium. Uh, so what happened here was they included about 5% cesium into the formamidinium methyl ammonium composition. So we call that the triple cation, and it's been uh, quite well established now. It improves the efficiency, uh, so here we have average around 20%. But also we were a little bit sticking out our neck here, also saying that the reproducibility is better. Of course, if you say that, you open up for referees to, to attack you, and that happened. Of course, they asked, well, why do you say that? You have to prove it. And they asked us to prove it by say, asking, is there only one person in your lab who can do this high efficiency? So we had to, so, and then we asked the team of three, four people to say, do this in parallel. 
uh, independently from each other, let's say, or at least with your own hands. And so this average actually based on four people in the lab doing this measurement. So we could, could uh, at least uh, answer the referee that it's, it's uh, per perhaps a better reproducibility. Um, what happens here, and there are, of course, your choice of the cations you can use depends on the tolerance factor. Uh, cesium is clearly inside the ratio here. Uh, then you have some other options like rubidium. It's a lot of discussion on potassium, as you know. Uh, so there are some more choices. What we could tell of this improvement was that we saw larger grains formed. For example, here you have a cross-section SEM. 0% cesium, that's the double cation, uh, fairly large grains, but they are also seeing grain boundaries in the horizontal direction like this here, which means that the charge has to uh, be transported across the grain boundaries. What we saw with the addition of the cesium is that we form very no nice monolithic uh, grains. So, we, for example, we see grains here which looks like single crystals from the top spiral layer here to the bottom TiO2 layer. So it means we think that charge doesn't need to cross any grain boundaries here and it's more efficient. Luminescence goes up, photovoltage goes up, that's the consequence. Then we are really not very sure what, how to explain this in a sort of atomistic or mechanistic uh, way, but I refer to a paper here which I found very interesting. It's from Professor Nasirudin's uh, lab and Paul Grazia is the or was the PhD student. Uh, he looked into the mechanism of the crystal formation of the perovskite film. He found uh, polytypes, hexagonal polytypes formed, uh, which are sort of intermediate uh, in the crystal uh, formations. So it's called 2H, 4H, 6H, and so on. They are environmentally uh, sensitive. And what he showed here in this paper is that when you add a few percent cesium, uh, you inhibit the formation of these intermediate hexagonal polytype structures. Uh, and then it becomes less sensitive to the environment and so on. So if you're interested in the mechanism, uh, I, I would say this is a very interesting paper published uh, in the autumn last year. Here you have the reference. Uh, of course, Michael Saliba couldn't help himself. He had to try more cations. So the next one in line was rubidium. So here is what we call the quadruple cations. So it's just sort of, so now it's rubidium, cesium, formamidinium, methyl ammonium. And that gives us uh, uh, the highest efficiency so far published from us. Uh, also very nice grains. The device data, we have about 22% here. Uh, higher today, but we'll see how far we can go. Also very interesting as a qualitative indicator is to look into the electroluminescence to do the solar cell in reverse. So uh, uh, a good solar cell is also a good LED. Uh, that's uh, how Eli Jablonovic always talks about it, which is very true, of course. Here we run a solar cell in reverse. This is a red light coming out of the solar cell. And it's actually a solar cell working in normal, that, which you don't see here. And this electroluminescence yield we have are, are very high, actually. We measure at similar short circuit currents injection as the solar cell provide 1% electroluminescence. And that maybe doesn't sound so high, but if we compare to disensitized cell, I also think OPV, that's around 10 to the minus 6, typically. So 1% is as good as the best, world best silicon and the best gallium arsenide is at around 20% electroluminescence yield. So this shows that perovskite has a good potential of, uh, of a quality. And we see that also with very high voltages. We measured 1.24 volt, which uh, with a band gap of 1.63. Theoretically, we lose 0.3 volts in entropy of light. So the highest theoretical limit we can obtain with such a band gap is 1.2. 33. So you see we are all just 90 millivolts away from the theoretical limit. So all these points to, to further, I would say, the increase of, of perovskite efficiency. Can it be stable? And we have heard that, yeah, there are many reasons why not. Uh, we started to work on that, and that's a PhD student, Conrad. Uh, we saw, i make a long story short, that at high temperature, 85 degrees, continuous illumination, 
the system we used were absolutely not stable. We dropped from 19% to 5%. And uh, we looked into it. It was a normal spiro, a spiro and a gold contact. We made a sims to look into what kind of elements go through the profile. So here you have the gold contact, spiro, perovskite, TiO2. We expected to see maybe iodide going into the spiro or something like that. But to our surprise, we found that the gold goes through spiro all the way into the TiO2 contact. So the problem was not the perovskite itself, it was the gold contact on the spiro. So if you want to, that was a very important uh, observation for us to work on stability. So what we did uh, in the quadruple paper was to replace spiro with a PTAA polymer, which is dense, doesn't let gold through, and then we have a very encouraging stability here. Starting at 17%, we go up to 85, continuous illumination, sunlight intensity, uh, maximum power point condition, and you see a very nice stability data for 500 hours. So that we published now, uh, was done two years ago almost. I think it's, a, it's a really encouraging data. Um, continuing, uh, Federico Bella from Torino came, said let me try to also encapsulate the cells because we used uh, our cells with nitrogen flow, so he came with a polymer uh, to encapsulate and he also made a nice thing here to put UV fluorescent molecules on the top. So the UV light is converted to visible light and that means that we boost our current with about one milliamp per square centimeter and also uh, 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 stabilized towards UV light. Uh, the data is here. Here is a little bit messy maybe. Here you have UV light, uh, no humidity. If we have uh, uh, not, uh, if we avoid, don't have these fluorescent molecules, it degrades quickly. With the UV fluorescent molecules on top, it's stabilized. Then we add humidity, 50%. If it's not encapsulated, degrades. But if it's encapsulated with UV light humidity, you see a very nice stability. And also for outdoor, this is a test for 90 days in the Torino outdoor setting and it has gone on for at least half a year stability. We have also another thing, I'm coming to the end, uh, which is interesting and that is that we often see an initial decay of the stability data. So here you start and then you start to run the aging test, continuous illumination, decline by 10% maybe and then it stabilizes. What happens if you switch off the light and take a good night sleep, let's say, the solar cell is back again. So it needs a rest. And that's, I think, very interesting as well. Uh, we have published a recent paper on this when we compare a continuous illumination test for 250 hours. We lose, so we are about 88% of the initial value. If we instead do the cycling uh, on and off with the light, we keep the initial value to 96% for the same time. So this addressed the question, uh, if we have this uh, on-off cycling behavior, how should we actually run an accelerated illumination test? My final reference is also to several authors here in the audience, including our chairperson, Monica, uh, to come up with some ideas on how to include this in our stability data, saying that maybe we should measure, if I understand it right, over a complete day to see how much energy we produce over the day, including the night cycle. And then we normalize to the initial day, let's say, and then we see uh, after how many days what is the degrada degradation. So with that, I uh, thank my team uh, in uh, at EPFL, of course, also a lot of collaborations, including the team of Michael Gretzel. I was thinking to make just one final thing, if I have 10 seconds. Uh, being from Sweden, and I know Ellen Mons is also here, I guess, uh, we are also a part of the Academy of Science in Sweden, we sometimes get the question, of course, what do you know about the price? Do you know anything? Can you tell us? We cannot, of course. We sign that it should be confidential for 50 years, so you have to wait a little bit. <laughs> but if, I can say, uh, if you want your country to be, have more Nobel Prizes, the answer is straightforward. Uh, and it's this graph here. You should eat more chocolate. <laughs> So this is the uh, Nobel laureates, this is the chocolate consumption and it follows quite nicely a straight line with 
of course, Switzerland <laughs> up there. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Anders, thank you very much for the nice talk. I'm sure there's a couple of questions. Uh, well, the thickness plays a role, but the, but the tight temperature you have uh, gold diffusing out, and spiro is, has voids enough to let it through. That's our picture. We were very surprised with the, that observation, uh, and people normally are. I know I gave a talk into a PV conference, and one said, well, we know this from organic electronics. It's, it's nothing special, actually, he said. So it's probably it has been well known, but for us it was surprising. So uh, we, and we, when we see stable device data, it's, as far as I know, never gold on spiral. You have carbon or ITO as your substrate and it looks very nice stability. So uh, I think if you just don't use <laughs> gold on spiral, you probably will have nice stability data. Okay, one more question. Is there a clue on why um, these solar cells need a night nap? Uh, well, so far we of very often see it, almost all the time, I would say. It's, it's, if, if there will be an initial decay for, I mean, it, it has to do with, the, let's, when we discuss why this happens, we, we refer to it as uh, ion mobility of the perovskite electron accumulation, follows very much the discussion of hysteresis problem. Uh, now we know that with the best cell efficiency of the device we have, we don't see so much of the hysteresis problem anymore. So I, I would not say that we always will have this initial decay. Perhaps when we improve the composition even more, uh, maybe this initial decay will also disappear because we stabilize the, the film. But we in our lab almost all the time see this initial decay. Would it somehow make sense to think that in equilibrium with light internally, the charges and yeah. everything are at a different Yeah, you're right. And then you relax. You As compared yes. to the night and then when, yeah. when you, the fields are off and the electrostatic yeah. internally then is different. Yeah, it goes back to in its initial it state. Back. Yes, that's what we think is happening. Okay, unfortunately due to time we have to move on, um, but we can continue discussions in the coffee break. So let's thank Anders again.